This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Today's recording by Chris V. The Spy by James Fenimore Cooper Edited by Nathaniel Waring Barnes Chapter 31 Hence bashful cunning, and prompt me plain and holy innocence. I am your wife if you will marry me. On joining Miss Pete, Francis learned that Dunwoody was not yet returned, although with a view to relieve Henry from the imp opportunities of the supposed fanatic, he had desired a very respectable divine of their own church to ride up from the river and offer his services. This gentleman was already arrived and had been passing the half hour he had been there in a sensible and well-bred conversation with the spinster that in no degree touched upon their domestic affairs. To the eager inquiries that Miss Peyton, relative to her success in romantic excursion, Frances would say no more than that she was bound to be silent, and to recommend that the same precaution of the maiden also. There were smiles playing around the beautiful mouth of Frances, while she uttered the injunction which satisfied her aunt that all as it should be. She was urging her niece to take some refreshment after her fatiguing expedition, when the noise of a horseman riding to the door announced the return of the major. He had been found by a courier, who was dispatched by Mason, impatiently waiting the return of Harper to the ferry, and immediately flew to the place where his friend had been confined, tormented by a thousand conflicting fears. The heart of Francis bounded as she listened to his approaching footsteps. He wanted yet an hour to the termination of the shortest period that the peddler had fixed as the time necessary to effect his escape. Even Harper, powerful and well disposed as he acknowledged himself to be, had laid great stress upon the importance of detaining the Virginians during that hour. She, however, had not time to rally her thoughts before Dunwoody entered one door. As Miss Peyton, with the readiness of female instinct, retired through another, the countenance of Peyton was flushed, and an air of vexation and disappointment pervaded his manner. "'Twas imprudent, Francis! Nay, it was unkind!' he cried, throwing himself in a chair, "'to fly at the very moment that I had assured him of safety. I can almost persuade myself that you delight in creating points of difference in our feelings and duties.' "'In our duties there may very possibly be a difference,' returned his mistress, approaching and leaning her slender form against the wall. "'But not in our feelings, Peyton. You must certainly rejoice in the escape of Henry.' "'There was no danger impending. He had the promise of Harper, and it is a word never to be doubted. "'Francis, oh, Francis, had you known the man, you would never have distrusted his assurances.' nor would you have again reduced me to this distressing alternative. "'What alternative?' asked Francis, pitying his emotions deeply, but eagerly seizing upon every circumstance to prolong the interview. "'What alternative? Am I not compelled to spend this night in the saddle to recapture your brother, when I had thought to lay my head on its pillow, with the happy consciousness of having contributed to his release?' You make me seem your enemy, I who would cheerfully shed the last drop of blood in your service. I repeat, Francis, it was rash, it was unkind, it was a sad, sad mistake. She bent towards him and timidly took one of his hands, while with the other she gently removed the curls from his burning brow. Why go at all, dear Peyton? she asked. You have done much for your country, and she cannot exact such a sacrifice at this time at your hand. Francis! Miss Wharton! exclaimed the youth, swinging on his feet, pacing the floor with a cheek that burned through his brown covering, and an eye that sparkled with wounded integrity. It is not my country, but my honor that requires the sacrifice. Has he not fled from a guard of my own corps? But for this I might have been spared the blow. 
but if the eyes of the Virginians are blinded to deception and artifice, their horses are swift of foot, and their sabers are keen. We shall see, before tomorrow's sun, who will presume to hint that the beauty of the sister furnished a mask to conceal the brother. Yes, yes, I should like, even now, he continued, laughing bitterly, to hear the villain who would dare to surmise that such treachery existed. Peyton, dear Peyton, said Francis, recoiling from his angry eye, you curdle my blood. Would you kill my brother? Would I not die for him? exclaimed Dunwoody, as he turned to her more mildly. You know I would, but I am distracted with this cruel surmise to which this step of Henry's subjects me. What will Washington think of me? Should he learn that I ever became your husband? If that alone impels you to act so harshly towards my brother, returned Frances with a slight tremor in her voice, let it never happen for him to learn. And this is consolation, Frances? Nay, dear Dunwoody, I meant nothing harsh or unkind, but you are not making us both of more consequence with Washington than the truth will justify? I trust that my name is not entirely unknown to the commander-in-chief, said the major, a little proudly, nor are you as obscure as your modesty would make you. I believe, Francis, when you say that you pity me, and it must be my task to continue worthy of such feelings. But I waste precious moments. We must go through the hills tonight, that we may be refreshed in time for the duty of tomorrow. Mason is already waiting my orders to mount. Francis, I leave you with a heavy heart. Pity me, but feel no concern for your brother. He must again become a prisoner, but every hair of his head is sacred. Stop, Dunwoody, I conjure you, cried Francis, gasping for breath, as she noticed that the hand of the clock still wanted many minutes to the desired hour. Before you go on your errand of fastidious duty, read this note that Henry has left for you, and which, doubtless as he thought, he was writing to the friend of his youth. Francis, I excuse your feelings, but the time will come when you will do me justice. That time is now, she answered, extending her hand, unable any longer to feign a displeasure that she did not feel. Where got you this note? exclaimed the youth, glancing his eyes over its contents. Poor Henry, you are indeed my friend. If any one wishes me happiness, it is you. He does, he does, cried Francis eagerly. He wishes you every happiness. Believe what he tells you, every word is true. I do believe him, lovely girl, and he refers me to you for its confirmation. Would that I could trust equally to your affections. You may, Peyton said Frances, looking up with innocent confidence towards her lover. "'Then read for yourself and verify your words,' interrupted Dunwoody, holding the note towards her. Frances received it in astonishment and read the following. "'Life is too precious to be trusted to uncertainties. I leave you, Peyton, unknown to all but Caesar, and I recommend him to your mercy. But there is a care that weighs me to the earth.' Look at my aged and infirm parent. He will be reproached for the supposed crime of his son. Look at those helpless sisters that I leave behind me without a protector. Prove to me that you love us all. Let the clergyman whom you will bring with you unite you this night to Francis and become at once brother, son, and husband. The paper fell from the hands of Francis and she endeavored to raise her eyes to the face of Dunwoody, but they sank abashed to the floor. Am I worthy of this confidence? Will you send me out this night to meet my own brother? Or will it be the officer of Congress in quest of the officer of Britain? And would you do less of your duty because I am your wife, Major Dunwoody? In what degree would it be better condition of Henry? Henry, I repeat, is safe. The word of Harper is his guarantee. 
but I will show the world a bridegroom, continued the youth, perhaps deceiving himself a little, who is equal to the duty of arresting the brother of his bride. And will the world comprehend this refinement, said Francis, with a musing air that lighted a thousand hopes in the bosom of her lover? In fact, the temptation was mighty indeed. There seemed no other way to detain Dunwoody until the fatal hour had elapsed. The words of Harper himself, who had so lately told her that openly he could do but little for Henry, and that everything dependent upon gaining time, were deeply engraved upon her memory. Perhaps there was also a fleeting thought of the possibility of an eternal separation from her lover, should he proceed and bring back her brother to punishment. It is difficult at all times to analyze human emotion, and they pass through the sensitive heart of a woman with a rapidity and nearly with the vividness of lightning. "'Why do you hesitate, dear Francis?' cried Dunwoody, who was studying her varying countenance. A few minutes might give me a husband's claim to protect you. Frances grew giddy. She turned an anxious eye to the clock, and the hand seemed to linger over its face, as if with intent to torture her. Speak, Frances, murmured Dunwoody. May I summon my good kinswoman? Determine, for time presses. She endeavored to reply, but could only whisper something that was inaudible, but which her lover, with the privilege of immemorial custom, construed into assent. He turned and flew to the door when his mistress recovered her voice. Stop, Peyton! I cannot enter into such a solemn engagement with a fraud upon my conscience. I have seen Henry since his escape, and time is all important to him. Here is my hand. If with this knowledge of the consequence of the delay, you will not reject it, it is freely yours. Reject him! cried the delightful youth. I take it as the richest gift of heaven. There is time enough for us all. Two hours will take me through the hills, and by noon tomorrow I will return with Washington's pardon for your brother and Henry will help to enliven our nuptials. Then meet me here in ten minutes, said Frances, greatly relieved by unburdening her mind, and filled with the hope of securing Henry's safety, and I will return and take those vows which will bind me to you forever. Dunwoody paused only to press her once into his bosom, and flew to communicate his wishes to the priest. Miss Peyton received the avowal of her niece, with infinite astonishment, and a little displeasure. It was violating all the order and decorum of a wedding to get it so hastily, and with so little ceremony. But Frances, with modest firmness declaring that her resolution was taken, she had long possessed the consent of her friends, and their nuptials for months had only waited her pleasure. She had now promised on Woody, and it was her wish to comply, more she dared not to say without committing herself, by entering into explanations that might endanger Birch or Harper or both. Unused to contention, and really much attached to the kinsman, the feeble objections of Miss Peyton gave way to the firmness of her niece. Mr. Wharton was too completely a convert to the doctrine of passive obedience and non-resistance to withstand any solicitation from an officer of Dunwoody's influence in the rebel armies. And the maid returned to the apartment accompanied by her father and aunt at the expiration of the time that she had fixed. Dunwoody and the clergyman was already there. Francis, silently and without the affection of reserve, placed in his hand the wedding ring of her own mother. And after some little time spent in arranging Mr. Wharton and herself, Miss Peyton suffered the ceremony to proceed. The clock stood directly before the eyes of Frances, and she turned many an anxious glance at the dial. But the solemn language of the priest soon caught her attention, and her mind became intent upon the vows she was uttering. The ceremony was quickly over, and the clergyman closed the words of benediction. The clock told the hour of nine. This was the time that Harper had deemed so important. 
and Frances felt as if a mighty load was at once removed from her heart. Dunwoody folded her in his arms, saluted the mild aunt again and again, and shook Mr. Wharton, and the divine repeatedly by the hands. In the midst of the fellation, a tap was heard at the door. It was opened, and Mason appeared. "'We are in the saddle,' said the lieutenant, "'and with your permission I will lead on, as you are so well mounted. You can overtake us at your leisure.' "'Yes, yes, my good fellow, march,' cried Dunwoody, gladly seizing an excuse to linger. "'I will reach you at the first halt.' The subaltern retired to execute these orders. He was followed by Mr. Wharton and the divine. "'Now, Peyton,' said Francis, "'it is indeed a brother that you seek. I am sure I need not caution you in his behalf, should you unfortunately find him.' "'Say fortunately,' cried the youth, "'for I am determined he shall yet dance at my wedding.' Would that I could win him to our cause. It is the cause of his country, and I could fight with more pleasure, Francis, with your brother by my side. Oh, mention it not. You awaken terrible reflections. I will not mention it, returned her husband. But I must now leave you. But the sooner I go, Francis, the sooner I shall return. The noise of a horseman was heard approaching the house, and Dunwoody was yet taking leave of his bride and her aunt when an officer was shown into the room by his own man. The gentleman wore the dress of an aide-de-camp, and the major at once knew him to be one of the military family of Washington. "'Major Dunwoody,' he said, after bowing to the ladies, "'the commander-in-chief has directed me to give you these orders.' He executed his mission, and pleading duty took his leave immediately. "'Here, indeed,' cried the major, "'is an unexpected turn in the whole affair.' But I understand it. Harper has got my letter, and already we feel his influence. Have you news affecting Henry? cried Francis, springing to his side. Listen, and you shall judge. Sir, upon the receipt of this, you will concentrate your squadron, so as to be in front of the covering party, which the enemy has sent up in front of his foragers, by ten o'clock tomorrow, on the heights of Croton, where you will find a body of foot to support you. The escape of the English spy has been reported to me, but his arrest is unimportant compared with this duty I now assign you. You will, therefore, recall your men, if any are in pursuit, and endeavor to defeat the enemy forthwith. Your obedient servant, George Washington. Thank God, cried Dunwoody, my hands are washed of Henry's recapture. I can now move to my duty with honor. And with prudence, too, dear Peyton, said Francis, with a face as pale as death. Remember, Dunwoody, you leave behind your new claims on your life. The youth dwelt on her lovely but pallid features with rapture, and as he folded her to his heart exclaimed, For your sake I will, lovely innocent. Francis sobbed a moment on his bosom, and he tore himself from her presence. Miss Peyton retired with her niece, to whom she conceived it necessary, before they separated for the night, to give an monitory lecture on the subject of matrimonial duty. Her instruction was modestly received, if not properly digested. We regret that history has not handed down to us this precious dissertation, but the result of all our investigation has been to learn that I partook largely of those peculiarities which are said to tincture the rules prescribed to govern bachelors' children. We shall now leave the ladies of the Wharton family, and return to Captain Morton and Harvey Birch. End of chapter 31《All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.》Read and recorded by Betsy Bush, Marquette, Michigan, January 2006.《The Spy by James Fenimore Cooper》Chapter 32 — Allow him not a parting word short of the shrift and sure the cord 
Rokeby. The peddler and his companion soon reached the valley, and after pausing to listen, and hearing no sounds which announced that pursuers were abroad, they entered the highway. Acquainted with every step that led through the mountains, and possessed of sinews inured to toil, Birch led the way, with the lengthened strides that were peculiar to the man and his profession. His pack alone was wanting to finish the appearance of his ordinary business air. At times, when they approached one of those little posts held by the American troops, with which the highlands abounded, he would take a circuit to avoid the sentinels, and plunge fearlessly into a thicket, or ascend a rugged hill that to the eye seemed impassable. But the peddler was familiar with every turn in their difficult route, knew where the ravines might be penetrated, or where the streams were fordable. In one or two instances, Henry thought that their further progress was absolutely at an end, but the ingenuity or knowledge of his guide conquered every difficulty. After walking at a great rate for three hours, they suddenly diverged from the road, which inclined to the east, and held their course directly across the hills in a due south direction. This movement was made, the peddler informed his companion, in order to avoid the parties who constantly patrolled in the southern entrance of the highlands, as well as to shorten the distance by travelling in a straight line. After reaching the summit of a hill, Harvey seated himself by the side of a little run, and opening a wallet that he had slung where his pack was commonly suspended, he invited his comrade to partake of the coarse fare it contained. Henry had kept pace with the peddler, more by the excitement natural to his situation than by the equality of his physical powers. The idea of a halt was unpleasant so long as there existed a possibility of the horse getting below him in time to intercept their retreat through the neutral ground. He therefore stated his apprehensions to his companion, and urged a wish to proceed. "'Follow my example, Captain Wharton,' said the peddler, commencing his frugal meal. "'If the horse have started, it will be more than man can do to head them, and if they have not, work is cut out for them.' that will drive all thoughts of you and me from their brains. You said yourself that two hours' detention was all-important to us, and if we loiter here, of what use will be the advantage that we have already obtained? The time is past, and Major Dunwoody thinks little of following two men when hundreds are waiting for him on the banks of the river. Listen, interrupted Henry, there are horses at this moment passing the foot of the hill. I hear them even laughing and talking to each other. Hist! There is the voice of Dunwoody himself. He calls to his comrade in a manner that shows but little uneasiness. One would think that the situation of his friend would lower his spirits. Surely Francis could not have given him the letter. On hearing the first exclamation of the captain, Birch arose from his seat, and approached cautiously to the brow of the hill taking care to keep his body in the shadow of the rocks, so as to be unseen at any distance, and earnestly reconnoitred the group of passing horsemen. He continued listening, until their quick footsteps were no longer audible, and then quietly returned to his seat, and with incomparable coolness resumed his meal. "'You have a long walk and a tiresome one before you, Captain Wharton,' "'You had better do as I do. "'You were eager for food at the hut above Fishkill, "'but travelling seems to have worn down your appetite. "'I thought myself safe, then, "'but the information of my sister fills me with uneasiness, "'and I cannot eat. "'You have less reason to be troubled now "'than at any time since the night before you were taken, "'when you refused my advice, "'and an offer to you in safety,' returned the peddler. "'Major Dunwoody is not a man to laugh and be gay when his friend is in difficulty. "'Come, then, and eat, for no horse will be in our way, "'if we can hold our legs for four hours longer, "'and the sun keeps behind the hills as long as common.' "'There was a composure in the peddler's manner that encouraged his companion, "'and having once determined to submit to Harvey's government, "'he suffered himself to be persuaded into a tolerable supper.' 
if quantity be considered without any reference to the quality. After completing their repast, the peddler resumed his journey. Henry followed in blind submission to his will. For two hours more they struggled with the difficult and dangerous passes of the highlands, without road or any other guide than the moon, which was travelling the heavens, now wading through flying clouds, and now shining brightly. At length they arrived at a point where the mountains sank into rough and unequal hillocks, and passed at once from the barren sterility of the precipices to the imperfect culture of the neutral ground. The peddler now became more guarded in the manner in which they proceeded, and took diverse precautions to prevent meeting any moving parts of the Americans. With the stationary posts he was too familiar to render it probable he might fall upon any of them unawares. He wound among the hills and vales, now keeping the highways and now avoiding them, with a precision that seemed instinctive. There was nothing elastic in his tread, but he glided over the ground with enormous strides, and a body bent forward, without appearing to use exertion or no weariness. The moon had set and a faint streak of light was beginning to show itself in the east. Captain Wharton ventured to express a sense of fatigue, and to inquire if they were not yet arrived at a part of the country where it might be safe to apply at some of the farmhouses for admission. "'See here,' said the peddler, pointing to a hill at a short distance in the rear. "'Do you not see a man walking on the point of that rock? Turn so as to bring the daylight in the range.' Now, see, he moves, and seems to be looking earnestly at something to the eastward. Two hundred of the Wrigler troops lay on that hill, no doubt sleeping on their arms. Then, cried Henry, let us join them, and our danger is ended. Softly, softly, Captain Wharton, said the peddler dryly, you've once been in the midst of three hundred of them, but there was a man who could take you out. See you not yon dark body on the side of the opposite hill, just above the cornstalks? There are the, the rebels, since that is the word for us loyal subjects, waiting only for day to see who will be master of the ground. Nay, then, exclaimed the fiery youth, I will join the troops of my prince, and share their fortune, be it good or be it bad. You forget that you fight with a halter round your neck. No, no, I have promised one whom I must not disappoint, to carry you safe in, and unless you forget what I have already done, and what I have risked for you, Captain Warden, you will turn and follow me to Harlem. To this appeal the youth felt unwillingly obliged to submit, and they continued their course towards the city. It was not long before they gained the banks of the Hudson, after searching for a short time under the shore, the peddler discovered a skiff that appeared to be an old acquaintance, and entering it with his companion, he landed him on the south shore of the Croton. Here Birch declared they were in safety, for the royal troops held the Continentals at bay, and the former were out in too great strength for the light parties of the latter to trust themselves below that river, on the immediate banks of the Hudson. Throughout the whole of the arduous flight, the peddler had manifested a coolness and presence of mind that nothing appeared to disturb. All his faculties seemed to be of more than usual perfection, and the infirmities of nature to have no dominion over him. Henry had followed him like a child in leading strings, and he now reaped his reward as he felt a bound of pleasure at his heart on hearing that he was relieved from apprehension and permitted to banish every doubt of security. A steep and laborious ascent brought them from the level of the tide-waters to the high lands that form, in this part of the river, the eastern banks of the Hudson. Retiring a little from the highway, under the shelter of a thicket of cedars, the peddler threw his form on a flat rock, and announced to his companion that the hour for rest and refreshment had at length arrived. The day was now opened, and objects could be seen in the distance with distinctness. Beneath them lay the Hudson, stretching to the south in a straight line as far as the eye could reach. To the north the broken fragments of the highlands threw upwards their lofty heads, 
above masses of fog that hung over the water and by which the course of the river could be traced into the bosom of hills whose conical summits were grouping together one behind another in that disorder that might be supposed to have succeeded their gigantic but fruitless efforts to stop the progress of the flood emerging from these confused piles the river as if rejoicing at its release from the struggle expanded into a wide bay which was ornamented by a few fertile and low points that jutted humbly into its broad basin on the opposite or western shore the rocks of jersey were gathered into an array that has obtained for them the name of the palisades elevating themselves for many hundred feet as if to protect the rich country in their rear from the inroads of the conqueror but disdaining such an enemy the river swept proudly by their feet and held its undeviating way to the ocean a ray of the rising sun darted upon the slight cloud that hung over the placid river and at once the whole scene was in motion changing and assuming new forms and exhibiting fresh objects in each successive moment at the daily rising of this great curtain of nature at the present time scores of white sails and sluggish vessels are seen thickening on the water with the air of life which denotes the neighbourhood to the metropolis of a great and flourishing empire but to henry and the peddler it displayed only the square yards and lofty masts of a vessel of war riding a few miles below them before the fog had begun to move the tall spars were seen above it and from one of them a long pennant was feebly borne abroad in the current of night air that still quivered along the river but as the smoke arose the black hull the crowded and complicated mass of rigging and the heavy yards and booms spreading their arms afar were successively brought into view there captain wharton said the peddler there is a safe resting place for you america has no arm that can reach you if you gain the deck of that ship she is sent up to cover the foragers and support the troops the wriggler officers are fond of the sound of cannon from their shipping without condescending to reply to the sarcasm conveyed in this speech or perhaps not noticing it henry joyfully acquiesced in the proposal and it was accordingly arranged between them that as soon as they were refreshed he would endeavour to get on board the vessel. While busily occupied in the very indispensable operation of breaking their fast, our adventurers were startled with the sound of distant firearms. At first a few scattering shots were fired, which were succeeded by a long and animated roll of musketry, and then quick and heavy volleys followed each other. "'Your prophecy is made good,' cried the English officer, springing upon his feet." our troops and the rebels are at it i would give six months pay to see the charge umph returned his companion without ceasing his meal they do very well to look at from a distance i can't say but the company of this bacon cold as it is is more to my taste just now than a hot fire from the continentals the discharges are heavy for so small a force but the fire seems irregular the scattering guns are from the Connecticut militia, said Harvey, raising his head to listen. They rattle it off finely, and are no fools at a mark. The volleys are the wrigglers who, you know, fire by word as long as they can. I like not the warmth of what you call a scattering fire, exclaimed the captain, moving about with uneasiness. It is more like the roll of a drum than skirmishers shooting. No, no, I said not scrimmagers returned the other, raising himself upon a knee, and ceasing to eat. So long as they stand, they are too good for the best troops in the royal army. Each man does his work as if fighting by the job, and then they think while they fight, and don't send bullets to the clouds, that were meant to kill men on earth. "'You talk and look, sir, as if you wished them success,' said Henry sternly. "'I wish success to the good cause only, Captain Wharton. "'I thought you knew me too well to be uncertain which party I favoured. "'Oh, you are reputed loyal, Mr. Birch, but the volleys have ceased.' "'Both now listened intently for a little while, "'during which the irregular reports became less brisk, "'and suddenly heavy and repeated volleys followed. 
"'They've been at the bayonet,' said the peddler. "'The wrigglers have tried the bayonet, and the rebels are driven.' "'Aye, Mr. Birch, the bayonet is the thing for the British soldier, after all. "'They delight in the bayonet.' "'Well, to my notion,' said the peddler, "'there's but little delight to be taken in any such fearful weapon. "'I dare say the militia are of my mind, "'for half of them don't carry the ugly things. "'Lord, Lord, Captain, I wish you'd go with me once into the rebel camp, "'and hear what lies the men will tell about Bunker Hill and Bergeen. "'You'd think they love the bayonet as much as they do their dinners.' There was a chuckle and an air of affected innocency about his companion that rather annoyed Henry, and he did not deign to reply. The firing now became desultory, occasionally intermingled with heavy volleys. Both of the fugitives were standing, listening with much anxiety, when a man, armed with a musket, was seen stealing towards them under the shelter of the cedar bushes that partially covered the hill. Henry first observed this suspicious-looking stranger, and instantly pointed him out to his companion. Birch started, and certainly made an indication of sudden flight. But recollecting himself, he stood in sullen silence, until the stranger was in a few yards of them. "'Tis friends,' said the fellow, clubbing his gun, but apparently afraid to venture nearer. "'You had better retire,' said Birch. "'Here are wrigglers at hand.' "'We are not near Dunwoody's horse now, and you will not find me an easy prize to-day.' "'Damn Major Dunwoody and his horse!' cried the leader of the Skinners, for it was he. "'God bless King George, and a speedy end to the rebellion, say I. "'If you would show me the safe way in to the refugees, Mr. Birch, I'll pay you well, "'and ever after stand your friend in the bargain.' "'The road is as open to you as to me,' said Birch, turning from him in ill-concealed disgust. "'If you want to find the refugees, you know well where they lay.' "'Aye, but I'm a little doubtful of going in upon them by myself. "'Now you are well known to them all, and it will be no detriment to you just to let me go in with you.' Henry here interfered, and after holding a short dialogue with the fellow, he entered into a compact with him, that, on condition of surrendering his arms, he might join the party. The man complied instantly, and Birch received his gun with eagerness. Nor did he lay it upon his shoulder to renew their march, before he had carefully examined the priming, and ascertained to his satisfaction that it contained a good dry ball cartridge. As soon as this engagement was completed, they commenced their journey anew. By following the bank of the river, Birch led the way, free from observation, until they reached the point opposite to the frigate, when, by making a signal, a boat was induced to approach. Some time was spent, and much precaution used, before the seamen would trust themselves ashore. But Henry, having finally succeeded in making the officer who commanded the party credit his assertions, he was able to rejoin his companions in arms in safety. Before taking leave of Birch, the captain handed him his purse, which was tolerably well supplied for the times. The peddler received it, and, watching an opportunity, he conveyed it, unnoticed by the skinner, to a part of his dress that was ingeniously contrived to hold such treasures. The boat pulled from the shore, and Birch turned on his heel, drawing his breath, like one relieved, and shot up the hills with the strides for which he was famous. The Skinner followed, and each party pursued the common course, casting frequent and suspicious glances at the other, and both maintaining a most impenetrable silence. Wagons were moving along the river road, and occasional parties of horse were seen escorting the fruit of the inroad towards the city. As the peddler had views of his own, he rather avoided falling in with any of these patrols than sought their protection. But, after travelling a few miles on the immediate banks of the river, during which, notwithstanding, the repeated efforts of the Skinner to establish something like sociability, he maintained a more determined silence, keeping a firm hold on the gun, and always maintaining a jealous watchfulness of his associate. The peddler suddenly struck into the highway, with an intention of crossing the hills towards Harlem. At the moment he gained the path, a body of horse came over a little eminence, 
and was upon him before he perceived them. It was too late to retreat, and after taking a view of the materials that composed this party, Birch rejoiced in the rencounter as a probable means of relieving him from his unwelcome companion. There were some eighteen or twenty men, mounted and equipped as dragoons, though neither their appearance nor manners denoted much discipline. At their head rode a heavy, middle-aged man, whose features expressed as much of animal courage, and as little of reason, as could be desired for such an occupation. He wore the dress of an officer, but there was none of that neatness in his attire, nor grace in his movements, that was usually found about the gentleman who bore the royal commission. His limbs were firm, but not pliable, and he sat his horse with strength and confidence. But his bridle hand would have been ridiculed by the meanest rider amongst the Virginians. As he expected, this leader instantly hailed the peddler, in a voice by no means more conciliating than his appearance. "'Hey, my gentlemen, which way so fast?' he cried. "'Has Washington sent you down as spies?' "'I am an innocent peddler,' returned Harvey meekly, "'and am going below to lay in a fresh stock of goods. "'And how do you expect to get below, my innocent peddler? "'Do you think we hold the forts at King's Bridge "'to cover such peddling rascals as you "'in your goings in and comings out?' "'I believe I hold a pass that will carry me through,' "'said the peddler, handing him a paper with an air of indifference. "'The officer, for such he was, read it, and cast a look of surprise and curiosity at Harvey, when he was done. Then, turning to one or two of his men, who had officiously stopped the way, he cried, "'Why do you detain the man? Give way, and let him pass in peace. But whom have we here? Your name is not mentioned in the pass.' "'No, sir,' said the Skinner, lifting his hat with humility. "'I have been a poor deluded man, who has been serving in the rebel army. "'But, thank God, I have lived to see the error of my ways, "'and am now come to make reparation by enlisting under the Lord's anointed.' "'Omph! A deserter! A Skinner! I'll swear, wanting to turn cowboy! "'In the last brush I had with the scoundrels, "'I could hardly tell my own men from the enemy.' We are not over well supplied with coats, and as for countenances, the rascals change sides so often that you may as well count their faces for nothing. But trudge on. We will contrive to make use of you sooner or later. Ungracious as was this reception, if you could judge of the Skinner's feelings from this manner, it nevertheless delighted him. He moved with alacrity towards the city, and really was so happy to escape the brutal looks and frightful manner of his interrogator, as to lose sight of all other considerations. But the man who performed the functions of orderly in the irregular troop rode up to the side of his commander, and commenced a close and apparently a confidential discourse with his principal. They spoke in whispers, and cast frequent and searching glances at the Skinner, until the fellow began to think himself an object of more than common attention. His satisfaction at this distinction was somewhat heightened, at observing a smile on the face of the captain, which, although it might be thought grim, certainly denoted satisfaction. This pantomime occupied the time they were passing a hollow, and concluded as they rose another hill. Here the captain and his sergeant both dismounted, and ordered the party to halt. The two partisans each took a pistol from his holster, a movement that excited no suspicion or alarm, as it was a precaution always observed, and beckoned to the peddler and the skinner to follow. A short walk brought them to a spot where the hill overhung the river, the ground falling nearly perpendicularly to the shore. On the brow of the eminence stood a deserted and dilapidated barn. Many boards of its covering were torn from their places and its wide doors were lying, the one in front of the building and the other halfway down the precipice, whither the wind had cast it. Entering this desolate spot, the refugee officer very coolly took from his pocket a short pipe, which, from long use, had acquired not only the hue but the gloss of ebony, a tobacco-box, and a small roll of leather that contained steel, flint, and tinder. With this apparatus he soon furnished his mouth with a companion that habit had long rendered necessary to reflection. 
so soon as a large column of smoke arose from the arrangement the captain significantly held forth a hand towards his assistant a small cord was produced from the pocket of the sergeant and handed to the other the refugee threw out vast puffs of smoke until nearly all of his head was obscured and looked round the building with an inquisitive eye at length he removed the pipe and inhaling a draught of pure air returned it to its domicile and proceeded at once to business a heavy piece of timber lay across the girths of the barn but a little way from the southern door which opened directly upon a full view of the river as it stretched far away towards the bay of new york over this beam the refugee threw one end of the rope and regaining it joined the two parts in his hand a small and weak barrel that wanted a head the staves of which were loose and at one end standing apart were left on the floor probably as useless the sergeant in obedience to a look from his officer placed it beneath the beam all of these arrangements were made with composure and they now seemed completed to the officer's perfect satisfaction come he said coolly to the skinner who admiring the preparations had stood a silent spectator of their progress he obeyed and it was not until he found his neckcloth removed and hat thrown aside that he took the alarm but he had so often resorted to a similar expedient to extort information or plunder that he by no means felt the terror an unpractised man would have suffered at these ominous movements the rope was adjusted to his neck with the same coolness that formed the characteristic of the whole movement and a fragment of board being laid upon the barrel he was ordered to mount but it may fall said the skinner for the first time beginning to tremble i will tell you anything even how to surprise our party at the pond without all this trouble and it is commanded by my own brother i want no information returned his executioner for such he now seemed really to be throwing the rope repeatedly over the beam first drawing it tight so as to annoy the skinner a little and then casting the end from him beyond the reach of any one this is joking too far cried the skinner in a tone of remonstrance and raising himself on his toes with the vain hope of releasing himself from the cord by slipping his head through the noose but the caution and experience of the refugee officer had guarded against this escape what have you done with the horse you stole from me rascal muttered the officer of the cowboys throwing out columns of smoke while he waited for a reply he broke down in the chase replied the skinner quickly but i can tell you where one is to be found that is worth him and his sire liar i will help myself when i am in need you had better call upon god for aid as your hour is short on concluding this consoling advice he struck the barrel a violent blow with his heavy foot and the slender staves flew in every direction leaving the skinner whirling in the air as his hands were unconfined he threw them upwards and held himself suspended by main strength come captain he said coaxingly a little huskiness creeping into his voice and his knees beginning to shake with tremor end of the joke tis enough to make a laugh and my arms begin to tire i can't hold on much longer hark ye mr peddler said the refugee in a voice that would not be denied i want not your company through that door lies your road march offer to touch that dog and you'll swing in his place though twenty sir henry's wanted your services so saying he retired to the road with the sergeant as the peddler precipitately retreated down the bank birch went no further than a bush that opportunely offered itself as a screen to his person while he yielded to an unconquerable desire to witness the termination of this extraordinary scene left alone the skinner began to throw fearful glances around to espy the hiding-places of his tormentors for the first time the horrid idea seemed to shoot through his brain that something serious was intended by the cowboy he called entreatingly to be released and made rapid and incoherent promises of important information mingled with affected pleasantry at their conceit which he would hardly admit to himself could mean anything so dreadful as it seemed but as he heard the tread of the horses moving on their course and in vain looked around for human aid violent trembling seized his limbs and his eyes began to start from his head with terror 
He made a desperate effort to reach the beam, but too much exhausted from his previous exertions, he caught the rope in his teeth in a vain effort to sever the cord, and fell to the whole length of his arms. Here his cries were turned into shrieks. "'Help! Cut the rope! Captain! Birch! Good peddler! Down with the Congress! Sergeant! For God's sake, help! Hooray for the Queen! Oh, God! Oh, God! Mercy! Mercy! Mercy!' As his voice became suppressed, one of his hands endeavored to make its way between the rope and his neck, and partially succeeded, but the other fell quivering by his side. A convulsive shuddering passed over his whole frame, and he hung a hideous corpse. Birch continued gazing on this scene with a kind of infatuation. At its close he placed his hands to his ears and rushed towards the highway. Still the cries for mercy rang through his brain, and it was many weeks before his memory ceased to dwell on the horrid event. The cowboys rode steadily on their route, as if nothing had occurred, and the body was left swinging in the wind, until chance directed the wandering footsteps of some lonely straggler to the place. End of chapter 32This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Betsy Bush, Marquette, Michigan, January 2006. The Spy by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 33. Green be the turf above thee, friend of my better days. None knew thee but to love thee, none named thee but to praise. Halleck. While the scenes and events that we have recorded were occurring, Captain Lawton led his small party, by slow and wary marches, from the four corners to the front of a body of the enemy, where he so successfully maneuvered for a short time, as completely to elude all their efforts to entrap him, and yet so disguised his own forces as to excite the constant apprehension of an attack from the Americans. This forbearing policy, on the side of the partisan, was owing to positive orders received from his commander. When Dunwoody left his detachment, the enemy were known to be slowly advancing, and he directed Lawton to hover around them, until his own return and the arrival of a body of foot might enable him to intercept their retreat. The trooper discharged his duty to the letter, but with no little of the impatience that made part of his character when restrained from the attack. During these moments Betty Flanagan guided her little cart with indefatigable zeal among the rocks of Westchester, now discussing with the sergeant the nature of evil spirits, and now combating with the surgeon sundry points of practice that were hourly arising between them. But the moment arrived that was to decide the temporary mastery of the field. A detachment of the eastern militia moved out from their fastnesses and approached the enemy. The junction between Lawton and his auxiliaries was made at midnight and an immediate consultation was held between him and the leader of the foot-soldiers. After listening to the statements of the partisan, who rather despised the prowess of his enemy, the commandment of the party determined to attack the British. The moment daylight enabled him to reconnoitre their position, without waiting for the aid of Dunwoody and his horse. So soon as this decision was made, Lawton retired from the building where the consultation was held, and rejoined his own small command. The few troops who were with the captain had fastened their horses in a spot adjacent to a haystack, and laid their own frames under its shelter to catch a few hours' sleep. But Dr. Sitgreaves, Sergeant Hollister, and Betty Flanagan were congregated at a short distance by themselves, having spread a few blankets upon the dry surface of a rock. Lawton threw his huge frame by the side of the surgeon, and holding his cloak about him, leaned his head upon one hand, and appeared deeply engaged in contemplating the moon as it waded through the heavens. 
The sergeant was sitting upright, in respectful deference to the surgeon, and the washerwoman was now raising her head, in order to vindicate some of her favorite maxims, and now composing it to sleep. "'So, sergeant,' continued Sitgreaves, following up a previous position, "'if you cut upwards the blow by losing the additional momentum of your weight, will be less destructive and at the same time affect the true purpose of war, that of disabling your enemy.' "'Pooh, pooh, Sergeant dear,' said the washerwoman, raising her head from the blanket. "'Where's the harm of taking a life, just in the way of battle? "'Is it the wrigglers who show favor, and they fighting? "'Ask Captain Jack there if the country would be free, and the boys no strike their might. "'I wouldn't make them disparage the whiskey so much.' "'It is not to be expected that an ignorant female like yourself, Mrs. Flanagan, returned the surgeon, with a calmness that only rendered his contempt more stinging to Betty, can comprehend the distinctions of surgical science. Neither are you accomplished in the sword exercise, so that dissertations upon the judicious use of the weapon could avail you nothing either in theory or in practice. It's hot little I care, anyway, for such botherment, but fighting is no play— and a body shouldn't be particular how they strike or who they hit, so it's the enemy. Are we likely to have a warm day, Captain Lawton? Tis more than probable, replied the trooper. These militia seldom fail of making a bloody field, either by their cowardice or their ignorance, and the real soldier is made to suffer for their bad conduct. "'Are you ill, John?' said the surgeon, passing his hand along the arm of the captain, until it instinctively settled on his pulse. But the steady, even beat announced neither bodily nor mental malady. "'Sick at heart, Archibald, at the folly of our rulers, in believing that battles are to be fought and victories won by fellows who handle a musket as they would a flail, lads who wink when they pull a trigger and form a line like a hoop-pole. The dependence we plan on these men spills the best blood of the country. The surgeon listened with amazement. It was not the matter, but the manner that surprised him. The trooper had uniformly exhibited on the eve of battle an animation and an eagerness to engage that was directly at variance with the admirable coolness of his manner at other times. But now there was a despondency in the tones of his voice, and a listlessness in his air that was entirely different. The operator hesitated a moment, to reflect in what manner he could render this change of service, in furthering his favorite system, and then continued, "'It would be wise, John, to advise the colonel to keep a long shot. A spent ball will disable.' "'No!' exclaimed the trooper impatiently. "'Let the rascals singe their whiskers at the muzzles of the British muskets, if they can be driven there. But enough of them!' "'Archibald, do you deem that moon to be a world like this, containing creatures like ourselves?' "'Nothing more probable, dear John. We know its size, and, reasoning from analogy, may easily conjecture its use, whether or not its inhabitants have attained to that perfection in the sciences which we have acquired, must depend greatly on the state of its society, and in some measure upon its physical influences.' I care nothing about their learning, Archibald, but tis a wonderful power that can create such worlds, and control them in their wanderings. I know not why, but there is a feeling of melancholy excited within me, as I gaze on that body of light, shaded as it is by their fancied sea and land. It seems to be the resting place of departed spirits. Take a drop, darling, said Betty, raising her head once more, and proffering her own bottle. "'Tis the night damp that chills the blood, and then the talk with the cursed militia is no good for a fiery temper. Take a drop, darling, and you'll sleep till the morning. I fed Roanoke myself, for I thought he might need hard riding the morrow. "'Tis a glorious heaven to look upon,' continued the trooper, in the same tone, disregarding the offer of Betty, "'and tis a thousand pities that such worms as men should let their vile passions deface such godly work.' "'You speak the truth, dear John. There is room for all to live and enjoy themselves in peace, if such could be satisfied with his own. Still, war has its advantages. It particularly promotes the knowledge of surgery, and—' "'There is a star,' continued Lawton, still bent on his own ideas, struggling to glitter through a few driving clouds. Perhaps that, too, is a world, and contains its creatures endowed with reason like ourselves.' 
Think you that they know of war and bloodshed? If I might be so bold, said Sergeant Hollister, mechanically raising his hand to his cap, tis mentioned in the good book that the Lord made the sun to stand still while Joshua was charging the enemy, in order, sir, as I suppose, that they might have daylight to turn their flank, or perhaps make a feint in the rear, or some such maneuver. Now, if the Lord would lend them a hand, fighting cannot be sinful. I have often been nonplussed, though, to find that they used them chariots instead of heavy dragoons, who are, in all comparison, better to break a line of infantry, and who, for the matter of that, would turn such wheel carriages, and, getting into the rear, play the very devil with them, horse and all. It is because you do not understand the construction of those ancient vehicles, Sergeant Hollister, that you judge of them so erroneously, said the surgeon. They were armed with sharp weapons that protruded from their wheels, and such broke up the columns of foot, like dismembered particles of matter. I doubt now if similar instruments were affixed to the carts of Miss Flanagan, that great confusion might be carried into the ranks of the enemy thereby this very day. "'It's but little that the mare would go, and the wrigglers firing at her,' grumbled Betty from under her blankets. "'When we got the plunder, the time we drove them through the jarsies it was— I had to back the baste up to the dead, for the divil the foot would she move, forned the firing, wide her eyes open. Roanoke and Captain Jack are good enough for the redcoats, letting alone myself and the mare. A long roll of the drums from the hill occupied by the British announced that they were on the alert, and a corresponding signal was immediately heard from the Americans. The bugle of the Virginians struck up its martial tones, and in a few moments both the hills, the one held by the royal troops and the other by their enemies, were alive with armed men. Day had begun to dawn, and preparations were making by both parties to give and to receive the attack. In numbers the Americans had greatly the advantage, but in discipline and equipment the superiority was entirely with their enemies. The arrangements for the battle were brief, and by the time the sun rose the militia moved forward. The ground did not admit of the movements of horse, and the only duty that could be assigned to the dragoons was to watch the moment of victory, and endeavor to improve the success to the utmost. Lawton soon got his warriors into the saddle, and leaving them to the charge of Hollister, he rode himself along the line of foot who, in varied dresses and imperfectly armed, were formed in a shape that in some degree resembled a martial array. A scornful smile lowered about the lip of the trooper as he guided Roanoke with a skilful hand through the windings of their ranks, and when the word was given to march, he turned the flank of the regiment and followed close in the rear. The Americans had to descend into a little hollow and rise a hill on its opposite side to approach the enemy. The descent was made with tolerable steadiness until near the foot of the hill, when the royal troops advanced in a beautiful line, with their flanks protected by the formation of the ground. The appearance of the British drew a fire from the militia, which was given with good effort, and for a moment staggered the regulars. But they were rallied by their officers, and threw in volley after volley with great steadiness. For a short time the fire was warm and destructive, until the English advanced with the bayonet this assault the militia had not sufficient discipline to withstand their line wavered then paused and finally broke into companies and fragments of companies keeping up at the same time a scattering and desultory fire lawton witnessed these operations in silence nor did he open his mouth until the field was covered with parties of the flying americans then indeed he seemed stung with the disgrace thus heaped upon the arms of his country Spurring Roanoke along the side of the hill, he called to the fugitives in all the strength of his powerful voice. He pointed to the enemy, and assured his countrymen that they had mistaken the way. There was such a mixture of indifference and irony in his exhortations that a few paused in surprise. More joined them, until, roused by the example of the trooper, and stimulated by their own spirit, they demanded to be led against their foe once more. "'Come on, then, my brave friends,' shouted the trooper, turning his horse's head towards the British line, one flank of which was very near him. "'Come on, and hold your fire until it will scorch their eyebrows.' The men sprang forward and followed his example, neither giving nor receiving a fire until they had come within a very short distance of the enemy. 
an english sergeant who had been concealed by a rock enraged with the audacity of the officer who thus dared their arms stepped from behind his cover and levelled his musket fire and you die cried lawton spurring his charger which leapt forward at that instant the action and the tone of his voice shook the nerves of the englishman who drew his trigger with an uncertain aim roanoke sprang with all his feet from the earth and plunging fell headlong and lifeless at the feet of his destroyer lawton kept his feet standing face to face with his enemy the latter presented his bayonet and made a desperate thrust at the trooper's heart the steel of their weapons emitted sparks of fire and the bayonet flew fifty feet in the air at the next moment its owner lay a quivering corpse come on shouted the trooper as a body of english appeared on the rock and threw in a close fire come on he repeated and brandished his sabre fiercely then his gigantic form fell backward like a majestic pine yielding to the axe but still as he slowly fell he continued to wield his sabre and once more the deep tones of his voice were heard uttering come on the advancing americans paused aghast and turning they abandoned the field to the royal troops it was neither the intention nor the policy of the english commander to pursue his success for he well knew that strong parties of the americans would soon arrive accordingly he only tarried to collect his wounded and forming in a square he commenced his retreat towards the shipping Within twenty minutes of the fall of Lawton, the ground was deserted by both English and Americans. When the inhabitants of the country were called upon to enter the field, they were necessarily attended by such surgical advisers as were furnished by the low state of the profession in the interior at that day. Dr. Sitgreaves entertained quite as profound a contempt for the medical attendants of the militia as the captain did of the troops themselves. He wandered, therefore, around the field, casting many a glance of disapprobation at the slight operations that came under his eye. But when, among the flying troops, he found that his comrade and friend was nowhere to be seen, he hastened back to the spot at which Hollister was posted, to inquire if the trooper had returned. Of course, the answer was in the negative. Filled with a thousand uneasy conjectures, the surgeon, without regarding, or indeed without at all reflecting upon any dangers that might lie in his way, strode over the ground at an enormous rate, to the point where he knew the final struggle had been. Once before, the surgeon had rescued his friend from death in a similar situation, and he felt a secret joy in his own conscious skill, as he perceived Betty Flanagan seated on the ground, holding in her lap the head of a man whose size and dress he knew could belong only to the trooper. As he approached the spot, the surgeon became alarmed at the aspect of the washerwoman. Her little black bonnet was thrown aside, and her hair, which was already streaked with grey, hung around her face in disorder. "'John, dear John,' said the doctor tenderly, as he bent and laid his hand upon the senseless wrist of the trooper, from which it recoiled with an intuitive knowledge of his fate. "'John, where are you hurt? Can I help you?' "'Ye talk to the senseless clay,' said Betty, rocking her body and unconsciously playing with the raven ringlets of the trooper's hair. "'It's no more will he hear, and it's but little will he mind your probes and your medicines.' Ah, Chone, and where will be the liberty now, or who will there be to fight the battle or gain the day? John, repeated the surgeon, still unwilling to believe the evidence of his unerring senses. Dear John, speak to me. Say what you will, that you do but speak. O oh God, he is dead. Would that I had died with him. There is but little use in living and fighting now, said Betty both him and the beast see there is the poor creature and here is the master i fed the horse with my own hands the day and the last mail that he ate was of my own cooking achone achone that captain jack should live to be killed by the regulars john my dear john said the surgeon with convulsive sobs thy hour has come and many a more prudent man survives thee but none better nor braver O oh, John, thou wert to me a kind friend, and very dear. It is unphilosophical to grieve, but for thee I must weep in bitterness of heart. 
the doctor buried his face in his hands and for several minutes sat yielding to an ungovernable burst of sorrow while the washerwoman gave vent to her grief in words moving her body in a kind of writhing and playing with different parts of her favorite's dress with her fingers and who will there be to encourage the boys now she said oh captain jack ye was the soul of the troop and it was but little we knowed of the danger in ye fighting Ach! he was no manly mouthed that quarrelled wid a widowed woman for the matter of a burn in the mate or the want of a breakfast taste a drop darling and it may be twill revive ye Ach! and he'll niver taste again here's the doctor honey him he used to blarney wid lapping as if the poor soul would die for ye ach he's gone he's gone and the liberty is gone with him a thundering sound of horses feet came rolling along the road which led near the place where lawton lay and directly the whole body of virginians appeared with dunwoody at their head the news of the captain's fate had reached him for the instant that he saw the body he halted the squadron and dismounting approached the spot the countenance of lawton was not in the least distorted but the angry frown which had lowered over his brow during the battle was fixed even in death his frame was composed and stretched as in sleep dunwoody took hold of his hand and gazed a moment in silence his own dark eye kindled, and the paleness which had overspread his features was succeeded by a spot of deep red in either cheek. "'With his own sword I will avenge him,' he cried, endeavouring to take the weapon from the hand of Lawton, but the grasp resisted his utmost strength. "'It shall be buried with him. Sit, Greaves, take care of our friend, while I revenge his death.' The major hastened back to his charger, and led the way in pursuit of the enemy. While Dunwoody had been thus engaged, the body of Lawton lay in open view of the whole squadron. He was a universal favorite, and the sight inflamed the men to the utmost. Neither officers nor soldiers possessed that coolness which is necessary to ensure success in military operations. They spurred after their enemies, burning for vengeance. The English were formed in a hollow square, which contained their wounded, who were far from numerous, and were marching steadily across a very uneven country as the dragoons approached. The horse charged in column, and were led by Dunwoody, who, burning with revenge, thought to ride through their ranks and scatter them at a blow. But the enemy knew their own strength too well, and standing firm, they received the charge on the points of their bayonets. The horses of the Virginians recoiled, and the rear rank of the foot throwing in a close fire, the major, with a few men, fell. The English continued their retreat the moment they were extricated from their assailants, and Dunwoody, who was severely but not dangerously wounded, recalled his men from further attempts, which must be fruitless. A sad duty remained to be fulfilled. The dragoons retired slowly through the hills, conveying their wounded commander in the body of Lawton, the latter they interred under the ramparts of one of the highland forts, and the former they consigned to the tender care of his afflicted bride. Many weeks were gone before the major was restored to sufficient strength to be removed. During those weeks, how often did he bless the moment that gave him a right to the services of his beautiful nurse! She hung around his couch with fond attention, administered with her own hands every prescription of the indefatigable Sitgreaves, and grew each hour in the affections and esteem of her husband. An order from Washington soon sent the troops into winter quarters, and permission was given to Dunwoody to repair at his own plantation with the rank of lieutenant-colonel, in order to complete the restoration of his health. Captain Singleton made one of the party, and the whole family retired from the active scenes of the war, to the ease and plenty of the major's own estate. Before leaving Fishkill, however, letters were conveyed to them, through an unknown hand, acquainting them with Henry's safety and good health, and also that Colonel Wellmere had left the continent for his native land, lowered in the estimation of every honest man in the royal army. It was a happy winter for Dunwoody, and smiles once more began to play around the lovely mouth of Francis. End of chapter 33「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on March 11, 2006. The Spy by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 34 Midst furs and silks and jewels sheen, He stood in simple Lincoln green, The center of the glittering ring, And Snowdon's knight is Scotland's king. Lady of the Lake by Sir Walter Scott the commencement of the following year was passed on the part of the Americans in making great preparations, in conjunction with their allies, to bring the war to a close. In the south, Green and Rawdon made a bloody campaign that was highly honorable to the troops of the latter, but which, by terminating entirely to the advantage of the former, proved him to be the better general of the two. New York was the point that was threatened by the Allied armies, and Washington, by exciting a constant apprehension for the safety of that city, prevented such reinforcements from being sent to Cornwallis as would have enabled him to improve his success. At length, as autumn approached, every indication was given that the final moment had arrived. The French forces drew near to the royal lines, passing through the neutral ground, and threatened an attack in the direction of the King's Bridge, while large bodies of Americans were acting in concert. By hovering round the British posts and drawing nigh in the Jerseys, they seemed to threaten the royal forces from that quarter also. The preparations partook of the nature of both a siege and a storm, but Sir Henry Clinton, in the possession of intercepted letters from Washington, rested within his lines, and cautiously disregarded the solicitations of Cornwallis for succor. It was at the close of a stormy day in the month of September that a large assemblage of officers was collected near the door of the building that was situated in the heart of the Americans' troops who held the jerseys. The age, the dress, and the dignity of deportment of most of these warriors indicated them to be of high rank, but to one in particular was paid a deference and obedience that announced him to be of the highest. His dress was plain, but it bore the usual military distinctions of command. He was mounted on a noble animal of a deep bay, and a group of young men in gayer attire evidently awaited his pleasure and did his bidding. Many a hat was lifted as its owner addressed this officer, and when he spoke a profound attention, exceeding the respect of mere professional etiquette, was exhibited on every countenance. At length the general raised his own hat and bowed gravely to all around him. The salute was returned, and the party dispersed, leaving the officer without a single attendant except his body-servants and one aide-de-camp. Dismounting, he stepped back a few paces, and for a moment viewed the condition of his horse with the eye of one who well understood the animal, and then, casting a brief but expressive glance at his aide, he retired into the building, followed by that gentleman. On entering an apartment that was apparently fitted for his reception, he took a seat, and continued for a long time in a thoughtful attitude, like one in the habit of communing much with himself. During this silence the aide-de-camp stood in expectation of his orders. At length the general raised his eyes and spoke in those low, placid tones that seemed natural to him. "'Has the man whom I wished to see arrived, sir?' "'He waits the pleasure of your excellency. I will receive him here, and alone, if you please.' The aide bowed and withdrew. In a few moments the door opened again, and a figure gliding into the apartment stood modestly at a distance from the general without speaking. His entrance was unheard by the officer, who sat gazing at the fire, still absorbed in his own meditations. Several minutes passed, when he spoke to himself in an undertone, "'Tomorrow we must raise the curtain and expose our plans. May heaven prosper them!' A slight movement made by the stranger caught his ear, and he turned his head and saw that he was not alone. He pointed silently to the fire, toward which the figure advanced, 
although the multitude of his garments, which seemed more calculated for disguise than comfort, rendered its warmth unnecessary. A second mild and courteous gesture motioned to a vacant chair, but the stranger refused it with a modest acknowledgment. Another pause followed, and continued for some time. At length the officer arose, and, opening a desk that was laid upon the table near which he sat, he took from it a small but apparently heavy bag. "'Harvey Birch,' he said, turning toward the stranger, "'the time has arrived when our connection must cease. Henceforth and forever we must be strangers.' The peddler dropped the folds of the greatcoat that concealed his features, and gazed for a moment earnestly at the face of the speaker. Then he dropped his head upon his bosom. He said meekly, "'If it be your Excellency's pleasure, it is necessary. Since I have filled the station which I now hold, it has become my duty to know many men who, like yourself, have been my instruments in procuring intelligence. You have I trusted more than all. I early saw in you a regard to truth and principle that, I am pleased to say, has never deceived me. You alone know my secret agents in the city, and on your fidelity depend not only their fortunes, but their lives. He paused, as if to reflect, in order that full justice might be done to the peddler, and then continued, I believe you are one of the very few that I have employed who have acted faithfully to our cause, and while you have passed as a spy of the enemy, have never given intelligence that you were not permitted to divulge. To me, and to me only of all the world, you seem to have acted with a strong attachment to the liberties of America. During this address, Harvey gradually raised his head from his bosom, until it reached the highest point of elevation. A faint tinge gathered in his cheeks, and, as the officer concluded, it was diffused over his whole countenance in a deep glow, while he stood proudly swelling with his emotions, but with eyes that sought the feet of the speaker. "'It is now my duty to pay you for these services.' Hitherto you have postponed receiving your reward, and the debt has become a heavy one. I wish not to undervalue your dangers. Here are a hundred doubloons. Remember the poverty of our country, and attribute to it the smallness of your pay. The peddler raised his eyes to the countenance of the speaker, but as the other held forth the money he moved back, as if refusing the bag. It is not much for your services and risks, I acknowledge, continued the general, but it is all that I have to offer. Here and after it may be in my power to increase it. Does your excellency think that I have exposed my life and blasted my character for money? If not for money, what then? What has brought your excellency into the field? For what do you daily and hourly expose your precious life to battle in the halter? What is there about me to mourn when such men as you risk their all? For our country, no, 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 not a dollar of your gold will I touch. Poor America has need of it all. The bag dropped from the hand of the officer and fell at the feet of the peddler, where it lay neglected during the remainder of the interview. The officer looked steadily at the face of his companion, and continued, "'There are many motives which might govern me that to you are unknown. Our situations are different. I am known as the leader of armies, but you must descend into the grave with the reputation of a foe to your native land.' Remember that the veil which conceals your true character cannot be raised in years, perhaps never. Birch again lowered his face, but there was no yielding of the soul in the movement. You will soon be old. The prime of your days is already past. What have you to subsist on? These, said the peddler, stretching forth his hands that were already embrowned with toil. 
but those may fail you. Take enough to secure a support in your age. Remember your risks and cares. I have told you that the characters of men who are much esteemed in life depend on your secrecy. What pledge can I give them of your fidelity? Tell them, said Birch, advancing and unconsciously resting one foot on the bag, tell them that I would not take the gold. The composed features of the officer relaxed into a smile of benevolence, and he grasped the hand of the peddler firmly. Now indeed I know you and although the same reasons which have hitherto compelled me to expose your valuable life will still exist, and prevent my openly asserting your character, in private I can always be your friend. Fail not to apply to me when in want or suffering, and so long as God giveth to me, so long will I freely share with the man who feels so nobly and acts so well. If sickness or want should ever assail you, and peace once more smile upon our efforts, seek the gate of him to whom you have so often met as Harper, and he will not blush to acknowledge you. It is little I need in this life, said Harvey. So long as God gives me health and honest industry, I can never want in this country, but to know that your excellency is my friend is a blessing that I prize more than all the gold of England's treasury. The officer stood for a few moments in the attitude of intense thought. He then drew to him the desk, and wrote a few lines on a piece of paper, and gave it to the peddler. That providence destines this country to some great and glorious fate I must believe, while I witness the patriotism that pervades the bosoms of her lowest citizens, he said. It must be dreadful to a mind like yours to descend into the grave, branded as a foe to liberty, but you already know the lives that would be sacrificed should your real character be revealed. It is impossible to do you justice now, but I fearlessly entrust you with this certificate. Should we never meet again, it may be serviceable to your children. Children! exclaimed the peddler. Can I give to family the infamy of my name? The officer gazed at the strong emotion he exhibited with pain, and he made a slight movement toward the gold, but was arrested by the expression of his companion's face. Harvey saw the intention and shook his head as he continued more mildly. It is, indeed, a treasure that Your Excellency gives me. It is safe, too. There are men living who could say that my life was nothing to me compared to your secrets. The paper that I told you was lost, I swallowed when taken last by the Virginians. It was the only time I ever deceived Your Excellency, and it shall be the last. Yes, this is, indeed, a treasure to me, perhaps he continued with a melancholy smile. Perhaps it may be known after my death who was my friend. But if it should not, there are none to grieve for me. Remember, said the officer with strong emotion, that in me you will always have a secret friend, but openly I cannot know you. I know it, I know it said Birch. I knew it when I took the service. Tis probably the last time that I shall ever see Your Excellency. May God pour down His choicest blessings on your head." He paused and moved towards the door. The officer followed him with eyes that expressed deep interest. Once more the peddler turned and seemed to gaze on the placid but commanding features of the general with regret and reverence, and, bowing low, he withdrew. The armies of America and France were led by their illustrious commander against the enemy under Cornwallis, and terminated a campaign in triumph that had commenced in difficulties. Great Britain soon after became disgusted with the war, and the state's independence was acknowledged. 
As years rolled by, it became a subject of pride among the different actors in the war and their descendants to boast of their efforts in the cause which had confessedly heaped so many blessings upon their country. But the name of Harvey Birch died away among the multitude of agents who were thought to have labored in secret against the rights of their countrymen. His image, however, was often present to the mind of the powerful chief, who alone knew his true character. And several times did he cause secret inquiries to be made into the other's fate, one of which only resulted in any success. By this he learned that a peddler of a different name but similar appearance was toiling through the new settlements that were springing up in every direction, and that he was struggling with the advance of years and apparent poverty. Death prevented further inquiries on the part of the officer, and a long period passed before he was again heard of. End of chapter 34「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on March 11, 2006. THE SPY by James Fenimore Cooper CHAPTER Thirty Five. Some village Hampton, that with dauntless breast the village tyrant of his fields withstood, some mute, inglorious Milton here may rest, some Cromwell, guiltless of his country's blood. Gray. It was thirty-three years after the interview which we have just related that an American army was once more arrayed against the troops of England. But the scene was transferred from Hudson's banks to those of the Niagara. The body of Washington had long lay moldering in the tomb, but as time was fast obliterating the slight impressions of political enmity or personal envy, his name was hourly receiving new luster, and his worth and integrity each moment became more visible, not only to his countrymen, but to the world. He was already the acknowledged hero of an age of reason and truth, and many a young heart among those who formed the pride of our army in 1814 was glowing with the recollection of the one great name of America, and inwardly beating with the sanguine expectation of emulating in some degree its renown. In no one were these virtuous hopes more vivid than in the bosom of a young officer who stood on the table rock contemplating the great cataract on the evening of the twenty fifth of July of that bloody year. The person of this youth was tall and finely moulded, indicating a just proportion between strength and activity. His deep black eyes were of a searching and dazzling brightness. At times, as they gazed upon the flood of waters that rushed tumultuously at his feet, there was a stern and daring look that flashed from them, which denoted the ardor of an enthusiast. But this proud expression was softened by the lines of a mouth around which there played a suppressed archness that partook of feminine beauty. His hair shone in the setting sun like ringlets of gold, as the air from the falls gently moved the rich curls from a forehead whose whiteness showed that exposure and heat alone had given their darker hue to a face glowing with health. There was another officer standing by the side of this favored youth, and both seemed, by the interest they betrayed, to be gazing for the first time at the wonder of the Western world. A profound silence was observed by each, until the companion of the officer that we have described suddenly startled and, pointing eagerly with his sword into an abyss beneath, exclaimed, "'See! Wharton, there is a man crossing the very eddies of the cataract, and in a skiff no bigger than an eggshell!' "'He has a knapsack, and is probably a soldier,' returned the other. "'Let us meet him, 
at the ladder, Mason, and learn his tidings. Some time was expended in reaching the spot where the adventurer was intercepted. Contrary to the expectations of the young soldiers, he proved to be a man far advanced in life, and evidently no follower of the camp. His years might be seventy, and they were indicated more by the thin hairs of silver that lay scattered over his wrinkled brow than by any apparent failure of his system. His frame was meagre and bent, but it was the attitude of habit, for the sinews were strung with the toil of half a century. His dress was mean, and manifested the economy of its owner by the number and nature of its repairs. On his back was a scantily furnished pack that led to the mistake of his profession. A few words of salutation, and on the part of the young men of surprise, that one so aged should venture so near the whirlpools of that cataract, were exchanged. When the old man inquired, with a voice that began to manifest the tremor of age, the news from the contending armies. "'We whipped the redcoats here the other day, among the grass on the Chippewa Plains,' said the one called Mason. "'Since when we've been playing hide-and-go-seek with the ships, but now we are marching back from where we started, shaking our heads and as surly as the devil.' "'Perhaps if you have a son among the soldiers,' said his companion, with a milder demeanour and an air of kindness, "'if so, tell me his name and regiment, and I will take you to him.' The old man shook his head. Passing his hand over his silver locks with an air of meek resignation, he answered, "'No, I am alone in the world.' "'You should have added,' Captain Dunwoody, cried his careless comrade, if you could find either, for nearly half our army has marched down the road, and may be at this time under the walls of Fort George, for anything that we know to the contrary. The old man stopped suddenly, and looked earnestly from one of his companions to the other. The action being observed by the soldiers, they paused also. "'Did I hear right?' the stranger uttered raising his hand to screen his eyes from the rays of the setting sun. "'What did he call you?' "'My name is Wharton Dunwoody,' replied the youth, smiling. The stranger motioned silently for him to remove his hat, which the youth did accordingly, and his fair hair blew aside like curls of silk, and opened the whole of his ingenious countenance to the inspection of the other. "'Tis like our native land!' exclaimed the old man with vehemence. "'Improving with time, God has blessed both!' "'Why do you stare thus, Lieutenant Mason?' cried Captain Dunwoody, laughing a little. "'You show more astonishment than when you saw the falls!' "'Oh, the falls! They are a thing to be looked at on a moonshiny night by your Aunt Sarah and that gay old bachelor Colonel Singleton.' But a fellow like myself never shows surprise, unless it may be at such a touch as this. The extraordinary vehemence of the stranger's manner had passed away as suddenly as it was exhibited. But he listened to this speech with deep interest, while Dunwoody replied a little gravely, "'Come, come, Tom, no jokes about my good aunt, I beg. She is kindness itself. And I have heard it whispered that her youth was not altogether happy.' "'Why, as to rumour,' said Mason, "'there goes one in Accomac that Colonel Singleton offers himself to her regularly every Valentine's Day, and there are some who add that your old great-aunt helps his suit.' "'And Jeanette,' said Dunwoody, laughing, "'dear good soul, she thinks but little of marriage in any shape, I believe, since the death of Dr. Sitgreaves.' There were some whispers of a courtship between them formerly, but it ended in nothing but civilities, and I suspect that the whole story arises from the intimacy of Colonel Singleton and my father. You know, they were comrades in the horse, as indeed was your own father. I know all that, of course, but you must not tell me that the particular prim bachelor goes so often to General Dunwoody's plantation merely for the sake of talking old soldier with your father. The last time I was there, that yellow sharp-nosed housekeeper of your mother's took me into the pantry and said that the colonel was no despisable match, as she called it, and how the sale of his plantation in Georgia had brought him—oh, Lord, I don't know how much. 
Quite likely, returned the captain. Katie Haynes is no bad calculator. They had stopped during this conversation in uncertainty whether their new companion was to be left or not. The old man listened to each word as it was uttered with the most intense interest, but toward the conclusion of the dialogue the earnest attention of his countenance changed to a kind of inward smile. He shook his head, and, passing his hands over his forehead, seemed to be thinking of other times. Mason paid but little attention to the expression of his features, and continued, "'To me she is selfishness embodied.' "'Her selfishness does but little harm,' returned Dunwoody. "'One of her greatest difficulties is her aversion to the blacks. She says that she never saw but one that she liked. And who was he? His name was Caesar. He was a house-servant of my late grandfather, Warden. You don't remember him. I believe he died in the same year with his master, while we were children.' Katie yearly sings his requiem, and upon my word I believe he deserved it. I have heard something of his helping my English uncle, as we call General Wharton, in some difficulty that occurred in the old war. My mother always speaks of him with great affection. Both Caesar and Katie came to Virginia with my mother when she married. My mother was an angel, interrupted the old man, in a voice that startled the young soldiers by its abruptness and energy. Did you know her? cried the son, with a glow of pleasure in his cheek. The reply of the stranger was interrupted by a sudden and heavy explosions of artillery, which were immediately followed by continued volleys of small arms, and in a few minutes the air was filled with the tumult of a warm and well-contested battle. The two soldiers hastened with precipitation upon the camp, accompanied by their new acquaintance. The excitement and anxiety created by the approaching fight prevented a continuance of the conversation, and the three held their way to the army, making occasional conjectures on the cause of the fire and the probability of a general engagement. During their short and hurried walk, Captain Dunwoody, however, threw several friendly glances at the old man, who moved over the ground with astonishing energy for his years, for the heart of the youth was warmed by a eulogism on a mother that he adored. In a short time they joined the regiment to which the officers belonged, when the captain, squeezing the stranger's hand, earnestly begged that he would make inquiries after him on the following morning, and that he might see him in his own tent. Here they separated." Everything in the American camp announced an approaching struggle. At a distance of a few miles, the sound of cannon and musketry was heard above the roar of the cataract. The troops were soon in motion, and a movement made to support the division of the army which was already engaged. Night had set in before the reserve and irregulars reached the foot of Lundy's Lane, a road that diverged from the river and crossed a conical eminence at no great distance from the Niagara Highway. The summit of this hill was crowned with the cannon of the British, and in the flat beneath was the remnant of Scott's gallant brigade, which, for a long time, had held an unequal contest with distinguished bravery. A new line was interposed, and one column of the Americans directed to charge up the hill parallel to the road. This column took the English in flank, and, bayoneting their artillerists, gained possession of the cannon. They were immediately joined by their comrades, and the enemy was swept from the hill but large reinforcements were joining the English general momentarily, and their troops were too brave to rest easy under the defeat. Repeated and bloody charges were made to recover the guns, but in all they were repulsed with slaughter. During the last of these struggles the ardor of the youthful captain whom we have mentioned urged him to lead his men some distance in advance to scatter a daring party of the enemy. He succeeded but in returning to the line missed his lieutenant from the station that he ought to have occupied. Soon after this repulse, which was the last, orders were given to the shattered troops to return to the camp. The British were nowhere to be seen, and preparations were made to take in such of the wounded as could be moved. At this moment, Wharton Dunwoody, impelled by affection for his friend, seized a lighted fusee, and taking two of his men, went himself in quest of his body, where he was supposed to have fallen. Mason was found on the side of the hill, seated with great composure, but unable to walk from a fractured leg. Dunwoody saw, and flew to the side of his comrade, saying, "'Ah, dear Tom, I knew I should find you the nearest man to the enemy.' "'Softly, 
"'Softly handle me tenderly,' replied the lieutenant. "'No, there is a brave fellow still nearer than myself, "'and who he can be I know not.' He rushed out of our smoke, near my platoon, to make a prisoner or some such thing, but, poor fellow, he never came back. There he lies, just over the hillock. I have spoken to him several times, but I fancy he is past answering. Dunwoody went to the spot, and to his great astonishment beheld the aged stranger. "'It is the old man who knew my mother,' cried the youth. "'For her sake he shall have an honorable burial. "'Lift him, let him be carried in. "'His bones shall rest on native soil.' "'The men approached to obey. "'He was lying on his back, "'with his face exposed to the glaring light of the few sea. "'His eyes were closed as if in slumber.' His lips, sunken with years, were slightly moved from their natural position, but it seemed more like a smile than a convulsion which had caused the change. A soldier's musket lay near him, his hands were pressed upon his breast, and one of them contained a substance that glittered like silver. Dunwoody stooped and removed the limbs, perceived the place where the bullet had found passage to his heart, the subject of his last care was a tin box, through which the fatal lead had gone, and the dying moments of the old man must have been passed in drawing it from his bosom. Dunwoody opened it, and found a paper in which, to his astonishment, he read the following. Circumstances of political importance, which involve the lives and fortunes of many, have hitherto kept secret what this paper now reveals. Harvey Birch has, for years, been a faithful and unrequited servant of his country. Though man does not, may God reward him for his conduct. Signed, George Washington. It was the spy of the neutral ground, who had died as he had lived, devoted to his country, and a martyr to her liberties. So ends chapter 35, and this concludes... THE SPY by James Fenimore Cooper